We're on an IFR flight inbound to Dulles. We're being told to expect the VOR approach into runway 12. It's not common in this day and age to get VOR approaches, especially into large airports like Dulles, but if you were flying in 1974, VOR approaches would be your bread and butter. Whether you were flying a Cessna like this, or a Boeing 727 like TWA Flight 514 on December 1st of that year. The VOR approach into runway 12 existed back then, just as it does now, although it would have looked a bit different. We're coming from the west. Back then, the first fix on the approach wasn't Cecil at 15 DME, it was Belma, the final approach fix at 6 DME. It had a minimum altitude of just 1800 feet. In addition, there were three theater routes that led onto the final approach course, each with minimum altitudes of 3,000 feet or more. The feeder routes led to the Round Hill intersection, which was 12 miles from the final approach fix. We're not going to be joining the approach on any of these feeder routes, though. Just like TWA Flight 514, we start out on an assigned heading of 100 at 8,000 feet. ATC tells us to expect the VOR approach into runway 12 at Dulles. The frequency for the RML VOR, which is on the field, is 113.5. We put that in and we'll push the CDI button to bring up the green needles coming off the VOR signal. The approach course is 120 degrees, aligned perfectly with runway 12, so we'll set that in our course selector. The VOR soon goes active. The needle is deflected left. At this point, we may start to think, as did the crew of Flight 514, what kind of routing onto the approach course we can expect. There are feeder routes from three waypoints. The two western ones are most likely to be used. They each have a minimum altitude of 3,400, so if we're clear to one of those points, we'll be able to descend to that altitude once on the route. The other option is that we get vectored onto the approach course. To intercept it, we'll need to fly a heading to the left of 120. That's what ATC decides to do here. They tell us, turn left heading 090 to intercept the 300 radial off the RML VOR, Maintain 8000. On this heading, we have a 30 degree intercept for the approach course. The needle slowly starts moving to center. Once it does, we'll be turning onto the approach course of 120, but we're still very far out from the station. In the 70s, aircraft like Flight 514 would have needed DME to tell them when they were crossing certain points on the approach. Our DME tells us that we're over 50 miles out still. Because of this, the needle is moving very slowly toward center. It's less sensitive this far out. ATC tells us to descend and maintain 7,000, so we start down a bit. We continue tracking towards the approach course. The needle finally comes in and we turn to the inbound course of 120. We're about 45 miles out still when we get our approach clearance. This is the actual clearance received on the day in question, and it's much different from what a modern approach clearance sounds like. TWA 514, you're cleared for a VOR DME approach to runway 12. And that's it. Okay, so now the question is, when should you descend, and to what altitude? As we said before, if we were doing one of the feeder routes, we should stay at this altitude, cross the fix, then descend to the minimum altitude on the route. Once on the final approach course, we could descend to 1800, the altitude we should hold when crossing the final approach fix. But we're already on the approach course. Can we descend to 1800 right away? The crew of Flight 514 concluded that they could, and following in their footsteps, we start our descent too. Today, our approach clearance would sound much different. Controllers are now obligated to assign an altitude to maintain until reaching a certain point or until getting established on course. What that might sound like today is, you're 44 miles from RML, maintain 4000 until 18 DME, cleared VOR DME approach runway 12. The key here is that we're not on a published segment of the approach. It's confusing to say that because we are, in fact, established on the approach course, but being on the radial used for the course and actually being on the approach course are two different things. We're too far out to be on a published segment of the approach. The altitude protections don't extend out to infinity along the radial. But as pilots, we can't know what a safe altitude is out here. We're on what's considered a radar vector. And in order for ATC to provide us these vectors, they also have to provide an altitude assignment. Why is all this important? Let's turn to our MFD and have a look at the relative terrain heights around us as we descend. Right now, it's all showing black, which means that the terrain is 2,000 or more feet beneath our present altitude. The flight crew discussed what the appropriate altitude to descend to was. The captain noted, as we did, that the minimum altitudes on the feeder routes 
was 3,400 feet. But because we're not using a feeder route and we're already lined up with the final approach course, the argument was we should be able to go down to 1,800 since this is the minimum altitude for the intermediate segment of the approach. However, the intermediate segment of the approach goes backwards from the final approach fix at 6 DME, 12 miles to the Round Hill intersection at 18 DME. Yes, we're on the radial, but we're not on the instrument approach course until we're on a published segment of it at the Round Hill intersection. 1800 is not a safe altitude until we're past Round Hill. We're below 4,000 feet and we start to see areas of green on our relative terrain map. These are areas less than 2,000 feet below us. As we get lower, we start seeing more green and we begin to see yellow, which is terrain less than 1,000 feet down, but still more than 100 feet lower. Geographically, we're about to cross the south fork of the Shenandoah River, beyond which is the eastern ridge of the Shenandoah Valley, the Blue Ridge Mountains. Beyond the Blue Ridge Mountains is the low-lying Washington, D.C. area and Dulles Airport, but we still have high terrain to cross before we get there. We level off at 1800. We're still 28 miles from the VOR, or 10 miles from the Round Hill intersection, which is where we'll be safe at 1800. There's now a bright red area directly in front of us. At this moment, both the crew of Flight 514 and we are concentrating on maintaining altitude and watching for when 6 DME comes up, which is the final approach fix and when we can descend further. In our minds, it makes sense that we did our descent from 7,000 down to 18 as soon as we were cleared, because we don't want to be too high too close to the field, and since we're on the approach course, we feel safe this far out. ATC received some of the blame in the NTSB report for what happened for not issuing an altitude instruction with the clearance, or at least for not letting the flight know that terrain clearance was now up to them. Nowadays, the ambiguity is gone with approach clearances containing the instruction to maintain a certain altitude at first. Still, the pilots had plenty of opportunity on the approach plate to tell that being at such a low altitude this far out was not safe. The key should always be to make sure if you're targeting your own altitudes that you're going down to minimums only when you're on a published segment of an approach, and when not yet on a segment, to let ATC tell you what altitude to maintain or to ask. Unfortunately though, it was right around here when the crew got its first look at terrain, and it wasn't the airport, but it was the side of Mount Weather in the mountains, which is where this flight tragically ended up. Changes to how ATC assigns approach clearances can prevent misunderstandings like this. More specific to this approach though, the minimum altitude is now 4,000 feet beginning at Cecil at 15 DME rather than 1,800 at Round Hill. For more IFR training, check out our Instrument Ground School at the link here and in the description.